yourself going. Also, I, I've got a bit of good news. Our girls' brigade captain, Laura Quilter, uh, was recently commissioned as president of the Girls' Brigade Scotland. Uh, that is an extremely high honour, and I'm sure Laura will fulfil her duties in that office. And I'm pretty sure the Girls' Brigade will probably get a shake up going forward with Laura at the helm, as we all know how Laura can, uh, can control things and conduct business. So, again, on behalf of the Cup Session and all the congregation, I would just like to congratulate Laura on receiving that high honour. I have no other inclinations. Will you please be upstanding and receive the word of God? <laughs> It's so good to be home this morning in Whitburn South. It really is. Shalom, peace be with you all. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let us worship the Lord this morning by singing our first hymn of praise. Him 660 in mission praise, the Lord's my ship.
He sheds light on our path. He takes away the sin of the world. Let us come before the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray. We praise you, wonderful God. We praise you, almighty God, for revealing yourself through your son, Jesus. Through his deeds, he showed your finest mercy, peace, and love, and astonished all who sees them. Look upon us, sweet Lord. May the darkness of our souls vanish before the beams of your brightness. Fill us with holy love. Open to us treasures of your wisdom. Encourage what you have begun in us and prompt us to ask in prayer what your Holy Spirit already desires for us. In the Father, turn your face to us, show us your glory, then shall our longings be satisfied and our life complete. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the company of your people, we confess our sins to you. We have been angry and impatient, complaining about the faults of others and failing to see our own. We have been lazy and selfish, neglecting the interest of others and pursuing our own. We have been faithless and unworthy, ignoring the strength you offer and relying upon our own. God of mercy, you have promised to forgive those who truly repent. Help us to accept your forgiveness and dwell in us by your Spirit through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood, cleansed from thy guilty stains. We do believe, we will believe, that Jesus died for us, and on the cross he shed his blood from sin to set us free. Lord, we approach you this morning in humble adoration, thanking you for your blood, which was shed for each one of us. And we thank you that the children of the Lord have a right to shout and sing, as the blood of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, cleanses us from all defilement, and its power has liberated us and set us free, and it is only through the blood that we will enter heaven's courts when our time on earth is over. Heavenly Father, lead us to the light of redemption this morning, the light that leads the wayward home, and offers us true salvation. Once again, we will be very careful what we ask and pray for, as we ask in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, 
as we forgive our debtors. Amen. You're watching No Wonder About this morning, so I'll, I'll stay here and I'll talk to you as VIPs. Very important people, the children. And I've often said coming back to Whitburn is really good because there's some churches I'm preaching in and it's so sad because there's no children. That should be our prayer in the Church of Scotland. Pray for our future generations. Hello there. How are you doing this morning? Okay? Okay. Very quiet. Do you know that you have a special friend who loves you with all his heart? A friend strong and gentle and kind. A friend you can talk to at any time. A friend who is always willing to listen to you and tell you. You may wonder, who is this special friend? Can somebody tell me? Okay. He's God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you with all his heart. He is the best, best friend you could ever have. This best friend lives in a special place. Can somebody tell me where and what is this special place where the Lord Jesus lives? It is called heaven. Heaven is God's home. Jesus called it my father's house. You cannot imagine how beautiful it is. In heaven, no one ever gets tired and no one grows old. Do you know there will be millions and millions of God's children there? All our friends and loved ones who trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior will be there. We will know them and they will know us. God will give special crowns to those who love the Lord Jesus and serve him there. And you know something? Millions of angels will also be there. Angels are simply God's servants. God sends his angels to watch over us while we are here on earth. But you know something? The most wonderful thing about heaven is this. The Lord Jesus will be there. We will see our Savior face to face. The Son of God, who loves us so much, he gave his life for us. In heaven, everyone loves and praises Jesus. Would you like to know that you will go to heaven someday? Well, I have some wonderful news for you. God wants you in heaven. Because he loves you. You can say God loves me. Say it right now. Say it right now. Point to yourself and say it again. God loves me. You've often heard me use the verse John 3.16. And I want everybody to do something this morning. John 3.16 simply says, So loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him shall not but have everlasting life. See what it says the world this morning, kids and adults. Put your own name in there. For God so loved Ailey. For God so loved Logan. For God so loved Maya. Maya. Sorry. For God so loved Maya. For God so loved Sophie that he gave. So let's put our name in there and say it all together. And instead of the world, put your own name in there. For God so loved that he gave only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Take this hymn, and I used to sing it every morning in Hartall Primary a long time ago when I was in Primary 1 and 2, so that I'm moving back. It's a long time. But we sung it every morning before the lessons began. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God's 
So now continue work up the mission trees number 31 and the blue leaves. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be forever acceptable unto thee, my Lord, God, Savior, and Redeemer. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Where was Jesus going? The disciples didn't know. These verses are read at most Christian funeral services, and it is explained that Jesus was returning to his Father in heaven, and he would one day come and take us to the place he has prepared for us in heaven, and so we will be with him forever. What do you think of? when you contemplate heaven? Are you looking forward to heaven? I would guess that you have not heard too many sermons on heaven. I heard one once about 10 years ago. Howard Espate was a young man with a passion for God and a way with words, and he spoke movingly about our journey to heaven and what we might see and how awesome and amazing it is. 
He was a young man, but he longed for the day when he would go there. He is now a minister in the Church of Scotland. But that sermon stood out because I hadn't heard one like it. Paul was taken up to heaven in a vision. He did not know whether in the body or out of the body, but God did not permit him to speak about it. What he saw must have been good because he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. Listen. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Paul longed for heaven and the physical presence of Jesus. Many people do not have that excitement and anticipation when they think of heaven. I have heard people say that heaven will be boring all that singing with choirs of angels. Perhaps the novelty and the intrigue of heaven will fade away after a while as do most things on earth. But we are stuck with it for an eternity. How do you feel when you sing? When we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Are you encouraged by that? Or can you not get your heads around 10,000 years, or a million years, or a trillion years? A pastor in the United States of America confessed, Whenever I think about heaven, it makes me depressed. I'd rather just cease to exist when I die. I can't stand the thought of that endless tedium. To float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a harp. It's all so terribly boring. A Church of England vicar was asked what he expected after death. He replied, well, if it comes to that, I suppose I shall enter into eternal bliss. But I really wish you wouldn't bring up such depressing subjects. Why do so many Christians including educated, ordained ministers and pastors, have such a vague, negative, and uninspired view of heaven. It is most likely the work of the devil, Satan. Jesus said that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. In Revelation 13, chapter 6, it says that the satanic beast opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and all who live in heaven. Satan had been evicted from heaven and he cannot bear it that we humans are now entitled to a place in the home he was cast out of. If Satan convinces us that heaven is boring, dull and undesirable, then we lose the joy and anticipation of going there. We might even dread it. Heaven is not up in the clouds. It is not some space filled with disembodied spirits. Jesus used words his disciples could understand when he said his father's house has many rooms and goes to prepare a place for you and me. Can we grasp the wonder of heaven, the beauty, the, the complete satisfaction we will find there? Can we journey through this life with confidence and our eyes fixed on that prize? In 1952, a young woman named Florence Chadwick set off to swim from Catalina Island to the shore of mainland California. She had been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways, and she was sure 
she could do this swim in the Pacific. It was foggy and cold, and she could hardly see the boats accompanying her. She swam for 15 hours, and then she begged to be taken out of the water. She could go no further. Her mother in a boat nearby told her it was not, it was not much further, and she could make it there. But she stopped swimming and was pulled out of the water only to then discover that she was less than half a mile from shore. At a news conference later, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could see the shore, I would have made it. For born again believers, that shore is Jesus Christ. And being with him in that place, he has promised to prepare for us where we will be with him forever. If we can see through the fog and picture our eternal home, then we will be comforted and filled with hope and anticipation. How do we get to heaven? We are familiar with the verse that tells us that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father, enters heaven except through him. Scripture tells us the present heaven is a temporary heaven and not our final destination. Revelation 21 tells us that Christ will come back in triumph to claim his own, his beloved bride, the church. And what did John see? What did John see? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and women, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So the present heaven is a temporary heaven and will be replaced in time with a new heaven and a new earth. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18 speaks of what will happen when the Lord returns. People were becoming concerned that Christians were dying and being buried in Christ had not yet returned. So what would become of them? Paul wrote from the message, and regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the master's word in it. That's when the master comes again to get us. Those, are, those of us who are still alive and will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. The master himself will give the command, Arch Archangel Thunder, God's trumpet blast. He'll come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. Then the rest of us who are still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet the master. Oh, we'll be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. So reassure one another with these words. So at the second coming of Christ then, there will be a bodily resurrection of those who have died and also an engathering of those who are still alive at that time. What is popularly referred to as the rapture. Does this mean that all those who have died over hundreds of years are not yet with the Lord? Some believe that. Because heavenly time is different from earthly time. 
They would argue that death seems to be instantly followed by resurrection, whether the gap is a thousand years or an hour, it is the same for all. But that is not the whole story, because it takes no account of the spirit. It is obvious that the spirit leaves the body with the final breath. It is no longer contained in the body. How often people say of the body after death that it is just an empty shell. The spirit has gone to the present heaven where God sits on his throne and Jesus sits at his side. When someone goes home to the Lord, heaven touches earth. Jesus comes to take us home. He walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death into the light of his heavenly kingdom. Jesus said to the thief on the cross that he would be with him in paradise today, not tomorrow or in more than 2,000 years, but today. I think that heaven is closer than we imagine. There are places on earth where it is easy to sense the presence of heaven. Iona is one of these places. It is called the thin place because heaven almost seems to touch earth on the narrow strip of land in the sea, the thin ribbon of rock and sand and makar hardly rising out of the water. We probably all know of thin places we have visited. Sometimes an ordinary place becomes a thin place because we sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps even church can be a thin place when we are fully engaged in worship and open to God. Is there a closer relationship between heaven and earth than we imagine? I think of Star Trek and the cloaking device that made a spaceship invisible. The spaceship exists in its solid mass of form, but it could be inches away and unseen until the cloaking device was deactivated. And there it was. Another verse often read at funeral services is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So heaven is in some unseen dimension. But we should also read the next verse, verse 10. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deeper things of God. Just about finished. The Holy Spirit is within us. And the Holy Spirit is in heaven. The Holy Spirit knows what heaven is like. So we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us glimpses of what heaven might be like. We can ask the Holy Spirit for to give us joy when we think of heaven. Joy is good for us. Nowhere in scripture does it say that heaven is dull or boring or undesirable. Being in the presence of Jesus himself will be reward enough. And yet he wants to give us more and more more pleasure and greater delights. We will gasp with wonder when we get to heaven. Our loved ones who have gone before us are having the time of their lives. Complete lives, whole lives, new lives. And there are so many facets of God and of heaven that we will never tire of exploring them. There is always more to discover. We will never get to the end of God. I heard God described as being like a huge diamond with so many sides or facets that they cannot be counted. As we go deeper into God, we find there are more depths to be fathomed. Of course, there are many questions we have about heaven. What will we look like in heaven? Will we recognize each another? What will we experience together? Will we sleep? 
work, play? What will our relationships be like? These questions I may address in another sermon. For the time being, I would sum up the words of the great theologian Jonathan Edwards, who wrote an amazing sermon entitled Heaven, a World of Love. He said that heaven, he said that in heaven, a resurrected body will come equipped with unimaginable capacity for joy. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said that a resurrected body will be far better than anything we knew on earth. Our body will be stronger, fuller, more spiritual, more glorious and everlasting. Our delight and knowledge and emotions will be renewed an enormous amount of joy. But some might say that joy could fizzle out. Edward says no, because we will have an ever increasing capacity for joy. You will look at each day through some new lens where you see more clearly, understand more fully, feel more deeply the truest joy, ever increasing, ever full joy for all eternity. But won't we run out of things to enjoy after 10,000 years? Edwards again says no, because God is infinite and endlessly deep and inexhaustible. Christ's love, grace, kindness, wisdom, power, and mercy are ever, never ending. Now when you sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, you have no need to dread or doubt. You will not be the same person as you once were. After 10,000 years, you will look back and say, how little I knew of him then. How much I have grown in my love for him, yet how much more I still have to learn of his character. Glory be to the Father. Glory be to the Son. Glory be to the Holy Spirit. God, three in one. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, it was your spirit hovering over the waters at the dawning of the first day. It was your voice echoing through the darkness that brought forth light. God of all ages, accept our sacrifice of praise. God of peace, who breaks down barriers and walls that divide us, we praise your holy name. God of eternity, who has loved us and by grace has saved us, we praise your holy name. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we now come in unity as a church body gathered in your name to pray for others. Abba, Father, we pray for your church here in this parish. We give thanks that we are a church with a mission and with a welcome to those in need around us. Help us to serve people without judgment and meet their needs. Pray for our church congregation. Heavenly Father, may we all recognize and acknowledge the gifts you give each one of us and help us to step out in faith, as you have called us to do. We pray for the needs of our loved ones, our friends and our neighbours. Help us to be there when needed, sharing the light and happy parts of life, and being supportive during the lowest and most miserable times. We remember all in special needs this morning, and bring before you, Heavenly Father, those ill at home or in hospital, and for those who care for them. We bring before you the unemployed, the poor, the lonely, the depressed, and those suffering injustice and neglect. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through your Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we beseech you to bring your peace, shalom, 
to all who are suffering today. And we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Father, may the inhabitants of this sin-torn world be drawn in supernatural power through your Holy Spirit to the foot of the cross of Jesus. And we ask and pray for saving grace for each man, woman, boy, and girl from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. Lord, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can enter heaven except through the blood of Christ. Hear our prayers this morning in the wonderful, beautiful, awesome name of Jesus. Final hymn this morning is one that I love so dearly. And I talk about to God be the glory. But Scott, if I happen to go to heaven and you're playing that organ, you play when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, son, because that's my departing hymn going out that door. Okay, you heard me. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. When they're all is called up yonder. The peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. The blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore.